awesome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to um, be talking to you all today. Um, I'm from South Africa, um, and my name's Gabby, and I'm really, um, yeah, just excited to show you what we do at MindJoy um, with Replit. If you want to introduce yourself in the chat, um, please do introduce yourselves. I do love getting to know people, so um, I'd love to know where you guys are and what your um, interests are and sort of what excites you. It's evening here where I am, so. Wow, awesome. Really um, excited to see um, so many people from all over um, and some kids watching. Yay, that's really cool. Um, well, like I said, I'm Gabby and I'll be chatting to you today about how we give kids um, coding superpowers with Replit. Um, but first things first, um, let's start with some trivia. So, um, or oh, agenda first. That's what we'll be going through, just a little intro. Um, I'll be exploring what is social learning, um, like why MindJoy exists, epic projects that we make in Replit, and then we'll be getting creative with AI powered by GPT-3. So trivia first, what do these three people, Seymour Papert, Elon Musk, and I all have in common? Uh, any guesses, you can type in the chat. <laughs> oh, I see South Africa. I maybe gave it away a clue in the intro. People of the universe are like that. Well, uh, you guessed it. Uh, we are all from South Africa. And um, in case anyone doesn't know, uh, Seymour Papert is one of the... Um, computer scientists from MIT lab that developed Logo, the um, Logo, the programming language for children. Um, and Replit has Turtle Graphics on the platform, which is a really great programming language, um, or uh, Turtle Graphics in Python, should I rather say, which is based on Logo, which is a great programming language for um, young people to explore, um, explore um, coding through. So, um, he's the grandfather of that. Um, so we are all from South Africa, but we're also um, all of the belief that the best way to learn is by doing. And Elon Musk is famous for saying, um, you know, you don't want to necessarily teach the application of a screwdriver and a wrench and a hammer, and then only start figuring out applied ways to use the tool, rather give kids an engine and let them take it apart and figure out how to use the tools on the job. Um, and so Seymour Papert had a more formal word for this, which was constructionism, which was we should all try and create experiences for um, constructing knowledge and understanding. Um, and that is the best way to learn. And, and, it, and we're not the only people who think this, but learning by doing with community is a thought that many educators and technologists have had. And it's a really interesting thing to try and unpack and understand what does it mean to learn by doing and what does it mean to learn with community. So I thought we'd just take a quick look at that. And this is maybe a little bit sort of um, academic, um, but I hope it's something useful and maybe shifts the way you perceive how learning happens. So. Sometimes people think that learning happens best when you're alone at a desk, sitting by yourself, typing away at your computer, reading through some wiki, trying to explain something or following along with a tutorial. But actually, um, very few people are really good at learning this way. And, and so, yes, really smart people, really motivated people um, excel at learning in this way. But for the rest of us, learning is actually a social phenomenon. We're constantly learning from each other and we're learning through imitation and doing um, from the people around us and from the environment with which we exist. 
And um, so social learning theory means basically we learn through observation. We learn from the things we pay attention to. We retain the things. We remember behaviors and tasks that we pay attention to. And then we, we embed that knowledge or understanding through repeating it and imitating it and performing tasks ourselves. And what is really important about all of this is, is, is the motivation. And so um, you, don't, you don't learn anything you're not compelled to learn. Um, school might force you to learn things, but it doesn't necessarily mean you have the desire to learn those things. I see a common kind of saying like, yes, kind of like a baby learning to say something. Exactly. Um, that's a great analogy. So, you know, we are learning from our environment all the time. Um, babies are a great example to look at. We, they learn through imitation and through reproduction. Um, and, and no one is formally telling them how to say words or how to walk or any of those kinds of things. Um, so this motivation piece is a really important thing to unpack. So if not everyone is good at learning by themselves, and most of us are social creatures and we learn socially, how do we create learning environments and communities that are fostering a motivation or a desire to learn? Um, this seems to be actually something scarce and kind of important. And so that's something I'm really interested in doing. And um, that's what we're interested in doing at MindJoy is, is figuring out how do we cultivate community around um, young people getting together to learn awesome things like programming. And these are some of the factors that we want to try and cultivate. And that is, um, is, is really based on in, um, Ryan and Desi's self-determination theory. And that looks at, well, when we experience competence or mastery, um, where we have the ability to act autonomously, where we get to make our own choices and where we feel connected, relatedness to um, the things we're working on, like projects or the people we're working with, like peers or awesome coaches or teachers or people in your community, friends and family. Those are the things that really sort of are driving one's motivation. And so if we can engineer these things, we can engineer communities of learning. Um, and that's what we do at MindJoy. Um, we really think that children should be learning with really powerful technologies and tools. And um, they should not just be learning with uh, toys, but with real tools that um, have build real competencies and skills. Um, and, and yes, they can be really enjoyable and fun, but really we construct knowledge through production, through making things, products that work. Um, and there can be a great sense of joy and wonder and play in doing those things. Interestingly, Maria Montessori was quite famous for saying that she didn't think um, pretend was a very useful thing always um, for children to do, which is a, it's a really, um, let's say, contested point because pretend has many um, benefits and, and wonderful ways of stimulating the imagination. But um, yeah, pre playing with real things like drinking from a real glass and learning the consequence of dropping the glass and it will break and you may hurt yourself um, versus just replacing the glass with a plastic cup, for example, um, breaks a feedback loop, which means learning is interrupted. And so we want to try and cre create learning environments in which um, young people can actually learn with real feedback loops and real consequences. And with that comes responsibility and challenge and competency. So at MindJoy, this is what we do. We try and connect kids who are of a similar interest level um, and skill level um, together with each other. We try and connect them with inspiring and meaningful projects that they can then work on in Replit's multiplayer mode. And we find a coach who can facilitate kids collaborating on these projects. And really what we want to do is we want to see coaches guiding from the side and the environment containing all the knowledge. And so this is really trying to change the model. Um, can everyone still hear me? I just saw somebody note it said, I can't hear anything. 
awesome. Thanks. Um, so what we really want to try and do is um, create it, an environment where the project has the knowledge. The coach is a facilitator, really guiding um, metacognitive interactions and um, the children are accessing the knowledge through the project and through collaborative peer learning. Um, hi, Lena. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. All right. So what kinds of projects do we work at at MindRoy? Um, well, we ask kids what kinds of things they're curious about. And we try and create projects that answer the questions they have about the world that they live in and the technologies that they use. So um, recently we've heard kids ask questions about um, Netflix. How does my Netflix recommend movies to me? Um, how does Snapchat work? Like, filter, how do Snapchat filters work? How does Instagram's algorithms work? What is, how is the auto complete on my WhatsApp messages happening? Um, how does Uber know, like, how to get me a driver? They have all these questions. And um, why is Siri really bad at answering my questions? These are some of, um, some of the um, questions that we've heard children at Mindjoy ask. And we've asked them, well, would they like to find an answer to these things? So um, that's what we do. We like to make projects by co-creating with kids and community. And what that means is um, kids ask a question and then we find developers um, to help us create projects to answer these questions and to create experiences that are highly engaging um, and give children an opportunity to um, experience technologies in a um, hands-on way. And um, yeah, so there's my little comic of something of a, a recent interaction we've had. And um, it's a kid who said, well, what is AI really? And why should kids care about it? Everyone keeps telling me AI is important for the fourth industrial revolution, but I don't actually know what that means. And, um, and so uh, when we went to ask some of our developer friends to help us answer this question. And, you know, obviously the developers love playing with cool technology. And so they were like, ah, oh, we should definitely play with GPT-3 for this, which came with its, a whole bunch of challenges in of itself because GPT-3 is not, uh, or OpenAI's playground is not available to under 18s. There are some uh, questions about, well, giving children access to a very powerful technology. It, can you do that? How do you do that? Is it supervised? Um, and there, there were many questions to answer and things to take into consideration. Um, and, and those are the, the types of conversations we want to be part of. And so um, I hope this works. I'm going to show you a little video quickly. Artificial intelligence. No. Can everyone hear? I don't know if you can give me a thumbs up. We're right. disrupting all kinds of industries. Artificial intelligence is a huge part of children's lives and it's only going to get bigger. Well, today we're going to meet a brand, well, new, AI. Meet a brand new AI. It's called GPT-3. 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 GPT-3 is an algorithm developed by OpenAI. What do you understand AI to be? I play Fortnite. And if there aren't enough players in the game, they will put AIs in. That's artificial intelligence. Your brain will basically be like a computer. And the microchip will tell the other person what you're going to say. Do you think a computer could teach itself in the future? Yes. GPT-3 is quite a big step from the ordinary coding world. You just give it instructions and it'll code it. Sure, that's very powerful. Yeah. Do you want to see if you can get it to give us some design ideas? It works. It did my homework. Oh, that's taking it to the next level. <laughs> it's kind of a cool story. What do you think? I think it's just incredible. GPT-3 makes it simple to enjoy coding. Awesome. So I hope you enjoyed that. So that just gives you a little sense of what um, our way of working with students is like and sort of our discovery and co-creation process. So what we've actually done, um, and I guess this is now the fun part, 
is we've created an environment in Replit where students can um, interact with GPT-3. Um, it is a, um, a really playful way of um, engaging with um, an AI, but it is a much uh, more constrained and um, safe um, sort of playground that we've created um, that is appropriate for, um, for under 18s. Um, it is not open source, it uses their API. We enable our students to um, use um, GPT-3 in our environment or in, through our projects. But if you were to create your own project, um, you would have to get your own API keys. Um, this over here, if you just um, take a look, you'll see our sort of file tree looks very different to um, the, a normal sort of um, file tree layout. And what we really have tried to do is use uh, text files and readmes in creative ways and really try to push the limits um, and boundaries of how um, we give instruction for programming. So often what we found is for like a 10 year old or a, a even younger seven year olds um, reading really long form um, documentation or instructions can be quite tedious and, and boring. And, um, and a lot of sort of cognitive work for a young mind that has to try and grasp coding concepts and then also like focus on some dry <laughs> reading. Um, so what we're trying to do is see if we can uh, sort of be inspiring um, and um, through our documentation and create readmes that are fun and playful. So uh, I don't know if you saw just quickly um, go back a little bit, but we've got a map, so kind of getting into the gamer's men mentality. Um, if you're lost, you'd use your map, you'd go to your map. Um, we would then maybe check out achievements to figure out what we'd want to do. Um, and if they, the achievements have our missions and our challenges. And, um, <laughs> and then inventory, which is a little bit inspiration from Minecraft, um, where you can collect things and um, <laughs> and save things. Um, so here we found a little piece of code snippet and we'll put the code snippet into our main pie and then hopefully we'll have a working program. And as we check off the challenges, we can track our progress in our achievement markdown file. So that makes it really fun and really trying to encourage active learning, but at the same time, breaking things up step by step. And so here we should see a program, our question pop up, and it says, hello, I'm Mindray Bot. I can't wait to get creative with you. What should we write about? And so I have launched a poll, um, and it says Batman or cheese. So if you would all be so kind as to vote, um, we can interact um, this way, and you can vote on what we should see work. All right. Oh, that's a really close one. I hope everyone's voted. I'll give it a couple more seconds. Um, all right, Batman it is. So let's just click on Batman and see. Um, we've inputted Batman into the input and then we hit enter and ran our program. And we saw what our Mindjoy bot outputted for us. And it gave us a list, as it said, what should we write about? A list about Batman. And it gave us some really elementary um, answers. And that may be as expected if you sort of noticed anything in the prompt um, as to why it's really a simple output. Or if you have any theories, you can let us know in the chat. Um, awesome. So um, yeah, we, we've, we've created this project for students to start exploring what a prompt means um, and how a um, how one might modify the prompt um, uh, to interface with it. So they are, one of our challenge was to modify the age of um, 
the user that we were showing it. Um, this challenge is to hack your homework. So you would, uh, <laughs> you would um, try and generate a list about solar farms. So here we can just sort of compare outputs between solar farms for three-year-olds versus solar farms for 14-year-olds, if there's any difference in what our prompt models. Um, and, and yeah, so you can really see by trial and error, we're trying to encourage playing with inputs versus how, like, how does it change when you change the input versus how does it change if you ch change your actual prompt? Um, here we would save our outputs that we wanted to keep um, as we're playing and exploring in our inventory. Um, and so the project sort of goes through step by step, little bits of code that you can explore and interact with and modify. Um, and that way uh, students can um, sort of start developing theories of how is this technology working? How does a neural net differ from a search engine? Um, how is it coming up with these answers? Are these answers factual? Do we need to fact check them? And um, if so, uh, what is actually happening then? So these are all the types of questions we've heard students ask um, while interacting with this project. And it's been really exciting to kind of see um, what people, um, you know, sort of theorize what they understand is happening and, and sort of the aha moments. So at my joy, we like to talk about aha moments. And these are kind of moments where you figure something out for yourself, moments where you discover something that you um, you discovered something about yourself that you thought you couldn't do, or sometimes where you persevere through a real, really like tough challenge, and and you you know you've just spent so much time trying to figure something out, and all of a sudden it clicks in place. So these are the kinds of moments we try and design for, and we really try and um, yeah uh, facilitate this type of learning. So here yeah, you can see we've modified the prompt in such a way from lines 18 to 19 that we're really now starting to um, craft and understand that we can um, imp or uh, modify the prompt to show um, GPT-3 something about the user, but also then uh, explain to it what we want it to output. Um, and 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 then obviously we're we're now playing with the tokens, which has some sort of meaning in terms of um, what we think might do. Most kids guess that it does. Dum dum dum. I don't know if anyone wants to write in the chat quickly what they think changing the tokens might do um, to the output. So yeah, it changed the length of the output and, and, and it's just pretty incredible. I, my mind just blows every time, um, you know, interfacing with this um, application, just what it can do and how quickly, um, yeah, so how quickly it can generate outputs. And interestingly, if you, you know, one of the things is you can, input the same thing multiple times, but the output will be completely different every time. So it, it, it's not just uh, personalizing a search. Um, it is really, uh, a, a, um, you know, it's, it's, there are some layers of uh, um, happening that we, Sorry, I'm just getting, getting some interesting comments here. Um, I'd love to answer them. So yeah, this is a really interesting project. Um, and this is something, you know, yes, it's frightening to some degree. And I'm curious to know why you think it's frightening. I'd love to know. Um, but I think it's a really important uh, place to have conversations and talk to students about their understanding of these technologies and how it works. So. Um, another, a time for another poll. If you give me one more second, what should we, there should be another poll that should pop up for you. And the question would be, what should we create together? So 
after we figured out how to um, modify our prompt and work with our prompt to complete our homework mission, um, we are then challenged to, to um, see if we can modify our, our bot to do something creative with us, like write lyrics or create a story or a fairy tale um, or rap songs or anything. So just for fun, just before we wrap up, I've launched one last poll. Um, if you want to um, just answer, um, what do you think we should um, create together? All right, let's see, rap songs about cheese. All right, so as you can see here, it says, sorry, I can't respond safely. So we, because we've built a proxy um, and we try to create a safe environment for students under 18 to engage with this technology, that's a content filter we've put in place so that students will not um, interface with dangerous outputs per se. Um, so we've got a very high um, level of um, a content filter set for very high um, with high toxicity or uh, sensitivity um, to filter out any sensitive or um, um, bias uh, outputs. And there we go. <laughs> um, I'm a cheese head from I'm from Wisconsin. I love cheese. Cheese is my favorite dish. Um, so. <laughs> There we go, that's our output. I find it just absolutely fascinating to see um, some levels of creativity and, um, and how that works. Um, it's really, really interesting um, to see and ask those questions, you know, what, what, is it, what is it going to be like being a child growing up in, in the future um, where uh, machines' outputs are indistinguishable from our own? What does that mean um, for how we perceive what it means to be human? And I think these are really important questions to um, engage um, with. So now that we've finished our project, we'll mark off our last achievements and we will submit them, submit our project in Replit. And so, um, yeah, that was our project. So thank you so much for coding with me virtually. Um, and yeah, like I said, we are really curious about the aha moments um, and, um, the aha moments, these are some of the aha moments we've had students have um, while interacting with this project. You know, is it cheating or plagiarism to get AI to do your homework? Um, this is a really interesting question that has come up a lot. Um, well, you know, a rebuttal to that as well as using a pencil or calculator cheating. Um, you know, other comments in response to that are technically you coded the bot or um, to do your your homework, right? So, um, um, you know, these are really interesting um, questions that we think are important to engage with. And, and then I don't think they're really clear cut answers, but um, one of our sort of aspirations is to view children as citizens. They're not um, many people that are going to grow up one day and become citizens. They are citizens now. And I think it is really important to treat young people this way um, as um, active citizens who are participating in, in digital citizenship and who need to be part of these conversations and have spaces where they can have these conversations. Um, these are really complex questions and ideas that we don't have the answers to, but I think if we can create more spaces where we can engage in this type of, um, and these kinds of discussions, um, and if we can find ways to have these discussions as grown-ups with young people, um, the better. Uh, so yeah, some takeaways, if you are an educator out there, um, I hope that you maybe feel inspired to use readmes in a whole new way, emojis for symbolic um, instruction recognition, maps to navigate projects and achievements to track missions and challenges, and creating roles um, are a great way to ensure active learning in multiplayer replets. So 
um, yeah, I hope those are some tools and techniques you might find useful. Thanks so much, everyone. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. Um, as you saw, Sadiq asked the question, are you worried about bots might be programmed to teach factually inaccurate history? What if they teach things like apartheid was good? I think that's a really interesting question. Um, my hope is that by actually engaging with the technology and understand how it, programming such technology works um, enables you to be more critical when you're consuming. So really our mission is that you don't want to just uh, encourage consumption of technology, but creation of technology. And so if you are making with this technology, you will hopefully be a more informed consumer. Um, and I think really, you know, um, there are, there's a lot of fake news out there, the rate at which like fake news and bias is produced by such technologies is already out there. Um, and the way people are accessing them are on social platforms. So I really think it is important to um, create um, spaces where people, um, young people included, can interrogate these ideas and really um, be challenged to think critically. And hopefully that critical thinking is something they take with them to other aspects um, of their lives when they are consuming things. But I think these are complex. These are complex. All right. Thanks, everyone. I hope you have a good evening.